My name is Ted Holsey. I'm Vice President of Marketing at eFolder and your host for today's event. Welcome to the eFolder Expert Series. This webinar series brings together experts from eFolder staff and partner community for deep dive discussions on key service and technical topics. Today's topic, eFolder BDR for Shadow Protect tutorial, Recovery Options, Virtualizing On-Site and Recovery in the Cloud. Today we are joined by Dave Stuffeldean, Senior Solutions Engineer at eFolder. In just a moment, I will further introduce Dave. Before we go through the agenda, let's cover a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. The recorded version of the webinar will be made available on eFolder's YouTube channel. We will also make copies of the slides available to those who attended the event. With over 370 people registered for today's session, we have put all participants in listen-only mode. You can enjoy the audio portion of today's event by either streaming it to your computer or by dialing in over the phone. Questions are strongly encouraged throughout. We have planned a special Q&A section at the end of today's discussion, but you may submit them as we go along, and we will try to address your questions on the fly. Today's presentation follows a logical flow from identifying client needs to a brief overview of the solution leading, to, leading into eFolder BDR for Shadow Protect demo for how to virtualize on-site with a BDR or how to recover in the cloud. And then we'll end with some additional resources and your questions. Now let me introduce Dave. Uh, Dave Stuffelbeam is Senior Solutions Engineer at eFolder. He brings over 20 years of technical experience to the channel team and is involved in technical, technical consulting and partner support for the entire range of eFolder solutions. Working for companies such as Macromedia, Coral, Novell, and StorageCraft prior to coming to eFolder, he has gained extensive and diverse technical knowledge with a special emphasis in cloud technologies. Dave has presented to and performed technical trainings at companies such as uh, Walt Disney, Pfizer, Procter & Gamble, Boeing, Walmart, and many more. Dave, thanks for joining us today, and welcome. Thanks, Ted. I appreciate it. OK. Um, let's just, I, what I would like to do is just make a couple um, you know, comments about the business continuity space before handing the ball over to Dave for the, the technical demo. I think when, when eFolder, when we're talking to partners and clients today, I mean, there are four really key things that are, that are keeping clients awake at night. Um, you know, first of all, there is still a huge installed base of inadequate backup solutions in the marketplace today. Small and medium businesses <clears throat> still are utilizing antiquated uh, tape backup systems to a large degree or maybe only using rudimentary file level backup uh, services to protect their data. But really the name of the game is not just protecting data but protecting the uptime and resiliency of your clients. Um, simply put, um, business continuity has gone from being an enterprise requirement to being a requirement for all businesses. And small and medium businesses today can't afford downtime uh, for their servers. Um, in addition, businesses of all sizes need to worry about um, real site-wide disasters, um, whether it's fires, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, massive ice storms like we're seeing in the southeast um, uh, today in the past couple days. Businesses of all sizes need to be worried about the continuity of their business locations and whether they can serve their clients um, in the face of any kind of disaster. And really, the thing that's making all of this possible is cloud technologies. The things that make it so businesses can ex expect enterprise class uptime and resiliency for their infrastructure, their software, and their servers is the ability to use the cloud to, to, to deliver these capabilities to the SMB market. And really, you know, the eFolder business continuity service portfolio really tries to address three key needs of partners. Um, of course, there's the everyday disasters. I mean, literally, I mean, the statistics are, you know, roughly 90% of all the disasters you're ever going to face are um, hardware failures, um, user error, um, servers going down on site, and um, it's what we really call everyday disasters. But there are the occasional site-wide disasters. The picture depicted there on the slide is, is of, the, uh, of the, the town of Joplin after a Category 5 a tornado wiped out literally almost the entire city. So site-wide disasters do indeed happen, and that's a key part of protecting your clients. But really, at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is protect people's productivity. It's about um, delivering. Uh, BDR and business continuity services to your clients so that you can get them quickly recovered, whether it's an everyday disaster or a site-wide disaster. And so um, eFolder BDR, some of you on the line today 
uh, maybe using eFolder BDR um, and you want to get a technical refresher or get some time with Dave to ask some, some advanced technical questions. But let me just explain how uh, eFolder BDR works. In eFolder, we, we are a cloud-centric company and we operate a petabyte scale storage cloud. And then we partner with software companies such as StorageCraft or Dell Aperture um, to uh, bring their image-based backup software solutions into a complete solution that we call BDR. And so um, in today we're going to be doing a deep dive on eFolder BDR for, for uh, Shadow Protect, which is the, the, the image-based backup solution from StorageCraft. But what eFolder does as well is we, we, help, we deliver partners a BDR appliance and all the cloud infrastructure and back-end services so that you can go out to your clients and deliver a, a turnkey um, business continuity solution. So I mean, the key parts of the solution is the image-based backup software will create images of the servers and snapshots. Those get stored locally on a BDR appliance in most cases, and then all of that gets backed up to the eFolder cloud. And then this gives you multiple different ways to uh, recover for a client. Whether you're doing a file level recovery or a whole system recovery, you can recover in minutes, not hours. You can recover on the appliance with vir on-site virtualization. You can do file level recoveries right from the appliance. Um, you don't need to be on site. You can do it all remote. Um, or if there is a site-wide disaster um, at a client location or your clients may be highly distributed and it might be more economical for you to do a cloud recovery than actually rolling a truck, um, you can also recover from the cloud. We can ship your data from our data center to you on disk. Um, or more commonly today, people are using the eFolder Continuity Cloud to do off-site virtualizations of whole client environments. And so, you know, a picture tells a thousand words, but this kind of just gives you an overview of the complete solution. You have production, you have production servers that are running the Shadow Protect software and the BDR appliance, which is running the Shadow Protect uh, software as well. And then all of this data is being protected and backed up nightly, usually, to the eFolder storage cloud. And then you have multiple different recovery options to keep clients um, uh, you know, up and productive. And so with that, let me um, turn it over to Dave. And let me just hand him the ball. And he will take it from here. And I just want to remind everybody um, that, um, let's see here. Um, Dave, you need to show your screen, of course. Um, just want to remind everybody, please ask questions as we go along. And um, I will uh, interject your questions with Dave. But Dave, take it away. We can see your screen. Great. Thanks, Ted. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, for, the, for the flow, for the rest of the, the, my, my portion of the presentation, we're going to focus on doing some simple file and folder level recoveries. Uh, I'm also going to show you some advanced features in, a, in mounting a Shadow Protect image where you can uh, take ownership of a file system or some advantages of, of mounting an image a certain way. Then I'm going to show you some of the advantages of uh, virtualizing a Shadow Protect image on the eFolder uh, Shadow Protect BDR as well. Also, I'm going to cover the ability to uh, the ability you have to configure the management of the Shadow Protect images with Image Manager to minimize your footprint in the cloud as well. Uh, just a brief overview of, of some of the advantages and settings that you can put in Image Manager. And then what we're going to do is switch over to the eFolder uh, Continuity Cloud node and actually show you what it looks like and what you can do and some of the, some of the options there. So uh, the first thing I have here is uh, I just have the machine that's actually being backed up. It's nothing fancy. In fact, it's just a base install of Windows 2008. It only has one drive, but it's great because it allows me to do quick backups and quick restores. Um, but uh, you know, there's just there's nothing really to show. One thing that I like to do here is I'm just going going to go ahead and create a new text document. I'm just going to call this uh, webinar. I'm just going to call it web. Hold on a second. Let me do a a txt here. Okay, so I'm just going to put the date and time of the the box, which is 11, 14, not 24, 14, um, and then I'm just going to put a random word. Ted, give me some some easy random word that I can just put in here that I know I sprung that on you. Sorry, buddy. January 30th. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than one. Okay, so I'm just going to save this out. 
Uh, the reason why is because I want to show the simplicity of actually getting at files and folders and, and everything. Shadow Protect is installed and it's running independently on this particular box, this uh, Server 2008. Uh, I, I do have the full install of Shadow Protect, so I can manage it from this machine. But I also have uh, the ability to manage the Shadow Protect agent uh, that's running on this box on the on the Shadow Protect BDR. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to minimize this one, and I'm going to bring up the um, the actual. This is our uh, our introductory model of our uh, our Shadow Protect BDR. This is our 1122. We've got models that uh, are introductory for for customers that don't need a, a, a really high end solutions, and we got models that'll knock your socks off. So uh, you know, if you got questions, reach out to us. We can we can cover those. So uh, here's the Shadow Protect image. Let me go into the management view. In here, I actually already have the Epic Dental file server. That's the machine that I was just on. Uh, connected and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go look at the backup job here and I'm going to tell it to fire off an incremental because it's already done its full uh, it's been running for a couple of months actually already this incremental is going to take just a matter of seconds to run uh, if this happened to be a uh, <coughs> excuse me a SQL server or exchange server as many of you know already shadow protect works within the VSS framework and will quiesce those technologies to get ready, and uh, it's it's a full compassing uh, backup uh, solution there. So we're already done with that backup. Um, now the reason I did that was because I wanted to come in and show. Uh, here is our backup that we just took. This incremental. Uh, I'm going to mount it simply. Uh, maybe that that text file I just created. Maybe it's actually my Exchange database, and I need to do a granular recovery of an email, uh, maybe an individual email or an entire mailbox, and, uh, and it's a backup from, from uh, 15 minutes ago. So you have a couple of options. Once you find the point in time that you know you need a backup, uh, you just right mouse click on that, and there's a couple of options. There's a mount option and a quick mount. If you're doing a simple file and folder level recovery, all you need to do is do the quick mount. And notice my drive letters here. I have a, a C, D, and an X. Um, in fact, this one was probably from my test earlier. I just need to do a quick dismount. Now I, only, I should only have a C and an X here. So I'm going to right mouse click and do a quick mount on this. I have to put in the passphrase. Um, this is the encryption that is being done within the Shadow Protect agent. So I'm actually encrypting it before I copy it or back it up to the BDR. And then what's going to happen here is it's going to look like it's going to hang, uh, but Shadow Protect will always open a new uh, Windows Explorer for you when this happens. So I'm actually looking at the file system of this other, this other server. Uh, if I wanted to get at that particular text file, I just go right to the administrator desktop, and there's that web txt with the text that we just typed there. Okay? So I know some of you, hold, uh, hold down, I know that's ma like magic, right? Uh, now that I, I'm just kidding. Now that I've got this, if this is my Exchange database, I could use a tool like that, that ships with our BDR, that's the granular recovery for Exchange, uh, and mount that EDB file and literally just drag and drop to my live production Exchange server. Uh, I can drag out my SQL database uh, and do my uh, individual restores. We don't have any tools that like do granular restores for SQL, but usually your database guys know how to, once they have the database, they know how to do that. So now that we have this, uh, I want to show you a more advanced way of doing this. I'm going to do a quick dismount. So um, one of the, a couple of the other options here is the mount option. <laughs> Not a couple. The other option is the mount option. This will run the mount wizard. This gives me the ability to come in and choose different ways to mount this file system. It gives me a little bit more information about the images, uh, the time, the date, uh, you know the the file GUID, um, also the the chain that's required to reconstitute this point in time, uh, the chain of, of files that it's using to uh, mount the image. Um, also, I can now choose the drive letter that I want to restore as well. Um, for a lot of people, that's not a really big deal, but there's some advantages if, if you choose to mount it as a subfolder under an NTFS file system. Maybe I have my domain controller that's you know purring along like a kitten, but my file server dies. Uh, and in a fix, I can mount this 
uh, as a folder maybe under my uh, domain controller and if I'm because I'm mounting it as a subfolder and on, on an NTFS file system all of the user shares and user rights will actually maintain so I could share this out and people could get out their files now there's another option here that allows rights too so I could check this and allow rights um, and what shadow protects going to do is any rights or any changes that happen are going to be tracked in a different incremental file, in a new incremental file, a new point in time. When I go to dismount this, um, it will give me the ability to save out those changes or actually discard those changes. This comes in handy in, in two time, in, in, I found it most handy that uh, I've actually taken a machine that's been hit by a virus. I mean, let's say it's just like a workstation. I've been backing it up with Shadow Protect. I can now mount that image. With, uh, with, with on another machine that has the latest, greatest virus protection, all the updates, mount it, read, write, run my uh, virus protection scanners and, and clean all of that off while the, uh, the real production machine is, you know, tired and down, resting. Then I could save the rights and save those changes and essentially removing the virus from the image and then restu restore the new point in time if I wanted to. Another case that this comes in handy is if I'm working with file systems that are not uh, like in a domain, it's just like a work group, and you have uh, user security enabled, and I go to mount an image on somebody else's machine, but I don't have the same user on the machine that I'm on, you can mount it read-write, uh, take ownership of that file system, the entire file system, so you can get at those files, and then save the ownership to a new incremental file, uh, and then that way, this, uh, that, that way you can get at it without having to take ownership again. That works really well for when uh, maybe one of your clients has to let somebody go and they want to image that laptop, capture that point in time, uh, but maybe they're not working in a domain situation where you have you know, a domain administrator that would have rights to that file system. So uh, I'm not going to mount this uh, uh, since we've already mounted it and we already know what it looks like once we do. Um, what I want to do now is, is move over to the next step. So we showed you how to do a simple file folder level recovery, you know, just drag and drop, copy it out, and the advantage is there. But what if, you know, like what Ted was saying, the, uh, the, the, the everyday disaster is the, you know, the server, maybe the, the uh, power supply went out on the server. It's just a, uh, a single power unit or power supply tower, and that's what they're running. Um, how, do you, how do you quickly recover that point in time uh, on the BDR? Well, StorageCraft has created some technologies. They use their own uh, what's called a virtual boot driver. And they use Oracle VirtualBox. Uh, many of you have seen this. Uh, many of you have seen it but have never done it. I recommend that you try this, um, especially before you get into a disaster scenario, so you know all of the crux and things that you need to do to get this to work. Also, guys, this is probably the best selling tool that you could use. If you have you know, just even a 30-day trial of Shadow Protect installed, on your laptop, and you have a USB drive, maybe you have a terabyte USB drive, and you walk up and you install a 30-day trial, say, on one of their laptops or a desktop, not something with a lot of data so it backs up quickly, you could back it up with a 30-day trial and then turn around on your laptop with Shadow Protect and the right version of VirtualBox installed and virtualize that machine right there in front of your customer and log in. Uh, they're going to they're gonna be sold. Because you're not only are you booting their machine, but you're doing it on a laptop, and you did it in a matter of minutes. Uh, it's actually a really great selling tool. So what we're going to do here, and let me expand this out. I'm going to pick this same exact point in time that we just took. I'm going to right mouse click and choose the virtual boot options. Now I could go down to the uh, start menu and, and launch it that way, but this allows me to start the wizard from the particular point in time that I want. So if you're ever wondering what versions of VirtualBox this supports, here's your version numbers right here. 4.2.4 is the latest. And if you go looking for that, you have to go to virtualbox.org. You have to go to the old versions, then the really old versions, and the really, really old versions, and you'll find that version. Um, and if you get lost, you know, contact us, and we'll, we'll get the right, we'll get a link for you as well. Again, I have encryption on the image, so I need to provide that passphrase. Now, <clears throat> Things that can be confusing here, if you remember when we looked at this box, I only have one drive. 
if I had a C and a, or if I had a D and an E and an F, if this was my small business server and my E was running my SQL data, my F was running my, SQL, or, uh, my exchange data, what have you, if those volumes were in this directory along with the C, they would automatically populate here. Okay? If they happen to be in a different folder, maybe I'm backing them up with a different backup job, a different time set, maybe every 15 minutes, but I'm only capturing the operating system every hour, I could add image file from a different location. So what I'm going to do here is just click Next. Now this is, this is creating the new virtual machine. So in Oracle VirtualBox, we're going to actually reach out to um, Oracle VirtualBox and create a new virtual machine for this. Okay? I'm not editing or renaming the internal uh, machine uh, name or anything of that. I'm just creating a virtual machine. Where this is a test and my live production machine is still running, I'm going to tell it to boot with no network adapter, just so a backup doesn't try to fire off and I have a, a split chain or different things like that. And this is great uh, for demoing and testing uh, your, your environments for, as well. If you want to come in and show on a quarterly basis, you want to show your customers, yes, but we're going to do a disaster recovery plan and test plan with you, and this is how we're going to show you. This is a great way to just demonstrate, yes, I can boot your virtual machine. Now what's going to happen here is you see a new point in time file is being created 10 minutes later uh, than, uh, than the file that we just took an incremental from. And Shadow Protect here, the virtual boot, is doing what's called the hardware independent restore. It's, it's opening up this new point in time and injecting the uh, virtual box drivers down into that cold operating system and saying, hey, you're no longer on that old machine that you were on before. You're now on the new machine, <coughs> and here's your drivers. So it's rebuilding the, the hardware abstraction layer, uh, for lack of a better term there. Uh, as soon as this gets done uh, completing, it's going to boot up the virtual machine here, um, and away it goes. Virtual machine successfully created. So here we go. We'll go ahead and start Windows normally. I get a lot of questions here where um, partners will be like, well, why, why is it coming up like it died, you know, like it, it suffered from a power failure? Well, in essence, to Windows, it did because you took the snapshot while it was live and hot and running, and it's now recovering from a failed state because uh, you're booting it up from a live. So that's why uh, Windows is going to be like, mm, what happened here? So typically what happens, your first boot is always a little bit slower because the operating system's trying to find drivers, trying to find things. Uh, you'll always, once you log in, you'll always get the, uh, I found new hardware, got a reboot kind of options, just like you would do if you were doing a typical migration to dissimilar hardware. Um, if this was a domain controller or you know, a small business server, I'd probably be hitting F8 on the boot up here and uh, going into directory services mode and, and following you know, the rules and things that I need to do there. So I'm going to just go ahead and log in really quick and show you that that point in time that we just booted was the point in time that has that text file on the desktop here. Um, once we move from this, move away from this, I want to show you how we have Shadow Protect, or excuse me, Image Manager configured uh, because we don't run Image Manager in our cloud simply because our backup manager software is encrypting the data again. Anything that goes up to our cloud is encrypted with our encryption. Uh, it's HIPAA compliant, so if you have medical customers uh, that you need to, um, you know, with the send, uh, you know, have a signed uh, business associate agreement, we can we can help you do that um, and everything. But uh, there's certain certain things that we need to have in place to send the data to the cloud because we're not uh, we're not running Image Manager in the cloud. I'm going to go over that. So here's that same text file. Uh, pretty cool. I'm running the virtual machine just within a matter of, you know, what that's like three minutes to, to a login screen here. Now, it's, it's running a little bit slow here probably because it's trying to get back out on the network and I don't have a network adapter and the machine's trying to be like its old self on the old hardware here. Okay, so we're up and running. It's installing new device drivers and, and everything. All right, I'm going to minimize this. Yeah, Ted. Can we try to, talk, can we try to tackle a couple questions here? <laughs> Let's do it. That's the perfect time. Great. So I think kind of back on the, um, the file level recovery portion, David wants to know, is there a way to exclude specific files from an image backup? Say I have a 2008 file server and I want to protect with Shadow Protect, 
but I don't want to back up the constantly changing 70 gigabyte page file every time the incremental runs. That's a great question. So um, the answer with image-based technologies, both with Shadow Protect and Aperture, the only way you can exclude files from a backup is to put them on a separate volume and not back up that volume. Simply because these technologies are backing up at the sector level, not at the file level. However, uh, and I'm not 100% sure about Aperture, but I believe it's exactly the same. Uh, both are Shadow Protect, and I believe Aperture is this way, it does not back up the hyper file or the page file either when it does a snapshot. So it actually ignores those. So you don't have to worry you know, about those large hyper files you know, if you have a laptop that's you know, hibernating a lot or a machine that's hibernating or the page file systems. So that's a great okay. question. Okay, and then there's a couple questions about the version of VirtualBox. So Brian wants to know, what is the version of VirtualBox again? Um, the latest version that it supports is the 4.2.4. If we, if we just, um, hold on a second. If we just, I'm going to pick another point in time here just to start the wizard. Uh, here are the versions, num the version numbers, and these are, these are quite old because VirtualBox releases new versions, almost updates almost weekly. It's, it's, they're a very, uh, very active development team there. So 3.1.0, 3.1.12, 4.02, 4.2.4. Now these are not just get you so, you, so everybody's on the same page. This is a requirement from StorageCraft, Shadow Protect. Uh, this is their, these are the versions they support. Um, and I recommend that you run these versions because if you don't, uh, and you run into a, another version and you call us for support, we're going to verify that you're running on these because StorageCraft's not going to support us if you're not running these versions. So it's, it runs like a champ. It does a really good job. This is the version I happen to be running. When you, when you purchase the BDR um, from eFolder, the, the StorageCraft BDR, all of this comes installed for you. In a standalone environment, if you needed to, to build this out for demo purposes or you got somebody who just really doesn't need a BDR, but you still want to be able to virtualize. These are the version numbers you want to adhere to. Right. So there was a follow-on question around that. Greg wanted to know. So is so is that to say that this this only works with really old versions of VirtualBox and not the current version? I think you kind of answered that, but yeah, yeah. And the reason why. So here's what's happening, and I I don't think I I delivered this very well, or I might not have delivered it at all. What's happening here? is the virtual boot wizard has a driver in it. And it's presenting this particular point in time, or whatever one we're choosing, as a virtual disk to virtual box. So that we're actually running out of the image. We don't have to do a restore. That's why this boots so fast. And that driver that StorageCraft has written is compatible with these versions. It may or may not work with later versions or other versions, but these are the versions that they pretty much say that they will support. Okay. And then uh, Pete has a, just a question about kind of the, the different deployment scenarios. And uh, the question is, do you require a separate BDR appliance, or can you just install Shadow Protect on the server you need to protect and back up to a local USB device? That's a great question. Um, Shadow Protect needs local storage, whether that, whether that is a you know, fancy everything's installed out of the box solution like, a, like an eFolder BDR or a standalone version that you're hanging a you know, Western Digital MyBook you know, two terabyte drive off the back end of the server. StorageCraft will back up to either of those environments. The image manager technology that I'm about to talk about will run without a BDR environment. In fact, neither of these technologies are even aware that an eFolder BDR exists. Right, so it will all work in a standalone environment, um, and that's the way it was built from the ground up. Um, but the advantages of the BDR is it's all in a, an all-in-one solution. You've got all of the right technologies uh, put together. The cool thing about the BDR guys and gals here is that they're it's all out of the box solution. We have a bunch of tweaks that we've done to make it easier, but you could go install all of this out-of-the-box solutions from all of the different vendors that we have on here, and it will work for you. Right, and I guess the, the other comment to make is that if you don't have a BDR appliance deployed, you, you don't have the ability to do you know, on-site on -site virtualization for that client. But for many small clients, 
they may or may not have the budget or the recovery time objective or need to do an on-site recovery. You know, so it, it really comes down to, you know, ePolder deploys a range of solutions that allows you to address the needs of very small clients who maybe can't afford a dedicated BDR appliance on site, but you want to protect those images off site to the eFolder cloud. And we call that the eFolder cloud for Shadow Protect. Um, or you can source the BDR appliance from eFolder. And as Dave just showed, everything you need comes pre installed and pre configured on the appliance. Or you can build your own BDR appliance. And we have an application note and provide you all the software assets you need and instructions you need to actually build an appliance yourself and use you know whatever flavor or brand of server appliance you want to use that's up to you and so that's really one of the hallmarks of eFolder's approach is that we give partners the flexibility to choose between these different deployment models while still getting all of the same benefits no matter which option you choose right and that that goes to your point earlier Ted about being an open platform an open cloud platform we have that flexibility because of that open platform Right, and there was a question Derek wanted to know just what are the, what's the, Dave, you were talking about kind of the range of eFolder BDR provided appliances, and he, there was a question Derek asked about just kind of the price points, and the, the entry level model is wholesale to our partner community uh, at, uh, you know, call it $1,750, so $1,750, and then they range all the way up to a model that's nearly $9,000, so there's five different models to choose from. And there's a whole range of different um, storage and memory um, configurations you can pick from depending on your client needs. So a lot of different appliances to choose from, and they're all field upgradable as well. So if you have clients who, who grow, outgrow their current deployment, you can field upgrade these appliances as well. So, okay. so with that, Dave, why don't we dive back in into the demo? Okay, perfect. Thanks, Ted. So I'm going to launch Image Manager. Now, Image Manager was created uh, basically to babysit uh, the continuous incremental schedule. And that's one thing I didn't, I didn't cover inside of Shadow Protect is the type of backup schedule that we're using. It's called a continuous incremental. Um, and I'll, get, I'll, maybe, I'll dive into that maybe just a little bit more and the advantages and disadvantages of that. Um, this has grown a, real, a lot over time. When I was at StorageCraft many years ago, um, this was, you know, a pop-up box, and you had like three options. Uh, but Image Manager has really grown in its capabilities. But what we want to look at is the settings that we need to put in uh, on the BD, <coughs> on the uh, when you're sending the the StorageCraft uh, data to the eFolder cloud. Some of the settings and what they mean here, um, because again, we're not running Image Manager in the cloud. We we need to minimize the impact of what you're going to have in the cloud. So the hourlies and the, the every hour on the hour, we typically don't recommend to send those to the cloud. However, we have partners that require it, and we have an open platform. So you can adjust the policy settings and get that data to the cloud. It's A-OK. -okay. Uh, you're just going to have a bigger footprint than most. Um, and, our, and our support department, our teams can help you configure this so you get the biggest thing for your buck. You're making the best margins you can off of a scenario like that. Um, we will be sending up to the cloud the full, uh, whether that comes on a USB drive and feeds that to our data center via the mail or FedEx or what have you. But then on a daily basis, we're going to be sending up the collapsed dailies and the collapsed monthlies. So Image Manager every day is creating collapsed dailies, weeklies, and monthlies. There's a new feature that's been, it's about 13 months old. Uh, and uh, I was really excited that, uh, that StorageCraft came out with this feature. And this is called a rolling consolidated file. And if I enable this cleanup consolidated monthly images, I can have a huge impact on my footprint in the cloud. What that means is I now, before, you know, before last year about this time, uh, if I was going to run this in the cloud, if I had a three-year contract with this company, with my customer for this BDR, and I wanted to maintain three years worth of images in the cloud, I would have my full, and I would have 36 monthly files at the end of my contract. Well, at the beginning of that, your margins are really good, and like you're taking the kids to McDonald's and letting them supersize, and everything is great. But at the end, your cloud footprint is so big, you're like, no, you're getting the dollar menu, and you're getting one thing. Um, so what this allows you to do is actually level out your um, and and kind of get a sustained base in there, and then you know, 
about four, five, six months, whatever you choose, however monthly that are in here, you know that's about what your margins are going to level out at. Uh, it's, an, it's a nice way to kind of predict, predict your earnings. Now, in this example, I'm keeping four, but this is all dependent on your customer and the SLA that you have in place with them and what they need to keep in the cloud. What I want to do very quickly here is I want to um, kind of show what happens um, <clears throat> during the collapsing. I'm just going to I'm going to cruise on this very, very fast. Um, I have some slides that depict this. So we have our one-time full, and let's say I'm taking incrementals day in and day out. The challenge of this is if one of these goes bad, then I'm dead from that point forward. I have to come back before my chain uh, is bad. Image Manager um, will create a collapse daily every day. So it's going to look at all of the incrementals for the day, and it's going to list out only the data that's needed, not all the data but only the data that's needed to create a single point in time. The advantage of that is, is that it's going to equal whatever your last incremental, the point in time is, uh, but it's going to rewrite the dependency chain. So at the end of day one, at midnight the next day, or midnight AM that night, um, my chain now looks like this. I may have 10 files, I may have 95 files here, but my chain, what needs to be there to restore to yesterday at 6 p.m. are just these two files. Now, we, I, wanna, I don't want to, again, I'm going to do a very high level, but every day I'm going to have incrementals hanging off of these. If I wanted to choose like the, the 2 p.m. incremental from this day, I can. I can actually choose the 2 p.m. and the chain will go from the 2, the, the 1, and the, all the way back to the 8, and then to this guy, and then to here. So what I want to depict here is this consolidated rolling file, what it's going to do. We have our collapsed dailies at the end of the week. It's going to lift out enough data and shove it into a collapsed weekly file. It's going to equal your last incremental for the week. It's going to, again, rewrite the dependency chain here. Again, I'm only just doing this for to kind of set the stage here. At the end of the month, what it's going to do is look at your collapsed weeklies, and it's going to lift out enough data. Plus, if, you're, if your end of the month isn't on a Saturday, it's going to actually make an end of the month time day. So if you're like, if, if it's, you know, tomorrow's the end of the month here and it's, it's a Friday, we will, uh, we, it'll be, this day will be Friday. So what happens here is month after month our chain grows and this is where we end up with 36 months. Now, with the new consolidated rolling file, this is what happens. Let's say I set for a six month retention policy, okay, six worth of month, six months worth of images. What happens is on month one through, one through six, everything is status quo. On month seven, it takes the January point in time and creates a new consolidated rolling file. It becomes the link now to the full. So not my oldest monthly here, but this file now becomes the link. These guys shift over, and now my July, and this, I'm sorry, and this becomes the link between the February uh, and the January time point, and then July pops in. Okay, now again, we do this again on month eight. February becomes the point in time. These guys move over. March is now the link, is the oldest monthly, and this consolidated rolling file is now the link uh, between the, the, the full and the oldest monthly. We let this run for a year. What does this look like for a year? We have a one-time full. Now, you know, if we started in January, like the first of January, our consolidated rolling file now equals June. Our monthlies now equal July through December, um, you know, and if we're this time next year or, you know, a year from now, we're going to have a couple of consolidated weeklies, some dailies, and then the incrementals. If this was the incremental from 15 minutes ago, my restore chain would look something like this if I was keeping six months' worth of monthly files. Okay. Now, I know we're probably going to get a lot of questions on that. We'll take them, but hold them for me here for just a second. These settings here are our minimums. So if you understood what I kind of just taught here, these are our minimums, minimums that we require. If you need to expand that, that's OK. And everyone, we've got documentation that walks you through this whole setup. So don't, uh, don't expect to walk away with like you're going to be able to walk into a customer and, and deploy this tomorrow. We've got a document that will help you deploy that tomorrow. Okay. So we're going to use the backup manager software that you use for the file and folder. Let me minimize that virtual machine. This uh, backup line, online backup software, when you, in, 
when it, again, when it's on the BDR, it all comes pre-configured. Um, I'm backing up to the X drive. So if you notice, this path is my X data volume images epic file, epic dental file server. Um, and I'm sending these up, I'm sending the collapse dailies up at 12.45 a.m. So this is the tool that we use to get the data to the cloud. It's also the tool that you're going to use to get the data from the cloud. Maybe, um, maybe you need to restore it to a different site. Maybe you need to restore it to dissimilar hardware. And you just want to pull the files down. You can use the file manager, pull that data down. If it's on a different machine, you're going to have to require uh, put in the path phrase that's used to encrypt it. Uh, again, we've got all the steps. All of this is documented. I just kind of wanted to show you what's you know, the data that's going up to the cloud and that this is the tool, the mechanism that gets it from the BDR up into the eFolder cloud. Now for our Aperture friends, I'll just touch on Aperture here. You actually will replicate from Aperture Core to Aperture Core in the cloud. Uh, and if you have more questions about that, reach out to us after the, after the webinar. But uh, it, it goes to the cloud a little bit differently. Okay? Uh, but it still goes to the exact same cloud. All right, now that we're... Maybe, Dave, maybe just two quick questions. So Please. Mark wants to know, is Image Manager application for StorageCraft an additional expense? Um, the answer to that is no, but it could be. Okay? They do have licensed features in here, but everything that we use is out of the box free. Uh, it's the complementary tool to store it, to Shadow Protect. So there is no charges. But if you wanted to use their replication or their automated Head Start Restore features, then those are features you would have to, to, to license. But in this solution, we're not using those. OK, and then Brenda is ask, asking a question that's related to kind of just what we covered. But she says, uh, what if we want to keep the cloud footprint small, say four months, but also allow the customer to have the option to have monthly backup images for two years? That gets a little bit more. That's a little bit more technical. What typically what we recommend, um, and until we get a way to run Image Manager in our cloud, which you know has been on our roadmap and we've been trying to figure it out for a while, we've got some ideas. So keep keep tuned. We're not giving up on it. Um, but what what you can do is you can back up to one particular directory, set the retention settings for your longer period here on the BDR. Then what you could use is you could either use our software, the, the file and folder, and, and have it copy the data to another folder and then manage it, manage image manager. So you'd have two sets of the backup, but then you would have image manager manage a much smaller retention on the copied data, and then you would send the copy data with the uh, backup manager software. Today that's if you're going to our cloud today, that's really the only way to do it. Because uh, okay. unfortunately, because we can't run the image manager in our cloud, but stay tuned, that may that may change one day. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, Ted, or should I keep rolling? Keep rolling. I just want to be sensitive on time. Go ahead. Oh, yep, yep. I'm moving to the last the last step, and this will go quick. So this is a, a remote desktop connection that we have to our continuity cloud. Um, so. What this is, and, and Ted depicted this in his slides really well, where you have your local failures that you can solve by remoting in and, and fixing it. But when you have a tornado or a sinkhole that wipes out the entire site, uh, earthquake, what have you, theft, um, when, you have a, when you have an entire site wipe failure and you need to recover these images into the cloud, our continuity clouds are the best way to go. Uh, typically, and, and again, this is the same node that you would receive if you were sending the Aperture data to the cloud and also the Shadow Protect data. We can configure it out of the box. It's actually configured out of the box to handle both. So what you're going to do is you're going to open up a critical ticket with support, uh, and we very quickly, as fast as we can, um, get you provisioned a, a physical node in our continuity cloud. It's actually in the same data center that your data is at. Okay? Um, with, that, with that being said now, it's a bare node, and you're going to get remote desktop access just like I have. You're going to get public IP addresses, so you're going to have NICs and stuff like that, where you have external NICs, and then you're going to have internal NICs that are going to copy data across the LAN. And that's actually an advantage, because our goal, once we have this node, we've got to get our Shadow Protect data to the Continuity Cloud node. And what we're going to use 
is basically the same tool that we used to get the data to the cloud. We're going to use that same tool to get the data from the cloud. The difference is, is we're actually in the cloud now. So we're going to put the same username and password that is backing the data up to the cloud in here. Um, <clears throat> actually, let me just show you this really quick. We'll go through the steps here. And I'll just pick Restore Data. And here's my, here's my folder structure, and here's that Epic Dental file server. I want to download that to this cloud. Now, if I have several other you know, servers that I'm backing up, there'll be checkboxes here that you can check. And you can choose which servers you want to recover to the cloud. Click Next, Original Locations, or I can choose where I want them to restore on the VDR. And then it's going to go look, uh, or it gives me the option if I already have restored data prompt for overwrite or what have you. Uh, and then it's going to go look in the cloud, and it's going to show me all of the files that it needs to download. Okay? Now, I, I did this just before the BDR, or just before the demo. So I'm just going to open up to where I have this already on the, on the continuity cloud. Here's that volume images, the Epic Dental file server. And here's my collapse daily from yesterday morning. <laughs> okay? So I can now, now that I'm here, I can right mouse click, mount, quick mount, virtual boot, just like we did. On the, on the local BDR and get these going. Also, you have Hyper-V installed here, too. Uh, on the BDR or on the BDR in the cloud, there is the Shadow Protect uh, recovery CD and different things like that. So you could, uh, if you wanted to, to do a recovery to Hyper-V and, and actually do a bare metal to a recovery uh, to actual virtual machine if you wanted to as well. Now, the next question I know that's in everybody's mind is great. How do I get access to this? Well, we know we have the public IP addresses. Both the VirtualBox and the Hyper-V have a virtual firewall uh, pre-configured. It's uh, running on a free BSD Unix uh, box. You just fire it up, and you actually have a web interface to that. It's going to be the same user credentials you use to log into the, the node, the administrator uh, username and password. Uh, then this gives you the ability to do port forwarding, open ports, put machines in a DNS, uh, whatever you need to do. If you need a DHCP server and a DNS server in the cloud environment, you can enable that. It has uh, options for VPN as well. So you can enable PP, PPTP or OpenSec, or I think there might be one other option. So the idea is once you get this here, uh, giving access is actually pre-configured, ready to go. Next question I usually get from that is, do I have to use your free BSD firewall? No. If you want to come in here and configure your own, something that you're used to and you want, you know, that you know, this is your note for the time that you're renting it or leasing it from us. It's an on-demand service, and when you have it, it's, it's yours. So if you need to set up a different type of firewall and you've got that SLA built into your time, go for it. Okay? Uh, another question that I get a lot when I'm talking to customers about or partners about our, our continuity cloud node is the sizes. Uh, the sizes can be, um, you know, how much can I virtualize on these boxes? Let's take a look at that. There's documentation that, uh, that kind of walks you through on how to get data and run, run everything. But we have two different sizes of nodes. And I'm actually on a medium node. It's hyper-thread. So if I look at the processors, it shows up as 8 here. Uh, but it's a 32 gig, 3 terabyte RAID 10. That's our medium. That's our, you know, our smallest one that we have. And our large is an 8-core. 96 gig and 10 terabytes worth of disk space. If you happen to have a customer that has a site-wide failure and you need to restore more than either of these are uh, capable of doing, our support department, our infrastructure team, can tie these boxes together so you could get two larges or a large and a, or a medium and a medium and a medium and a large, what have you, uh, and we can VLAN that traffic on the back end for you. Uh, to keep that that segmented uh, to keep that segment private for your for your customer there, so um, yeah, I think and that's I think this gives you a good idea. Again, all of this comes out of the box technology already on the BDR, ready to go. And this is uh, typically when you uh, order this from us, it's by a, a weekly basis. Um, and um, you know, typically, if you're going to be on there more than three weeks, it's cheaper to go monthly rate. You save like 25% if you go on a monthly rate. If you know, hey, somebody's building burned down, and it's going to be two months before they get moved into a new place, then you might, you know, 
negotiate a monthly rate uh, with that too. So uh, Ted, that's basically everything I've had uh, up to this point. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to you and we'll go from there unless there was questions here that uh, you want me to take. Okay, well let's um, let's just wrap up um, and then um, just wrap up with a couple final questions. So, um, just some additional resources. Um, we do uh, small group trainings every Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, if there's additional people on your team, um, if you're if you're not yet an eFolder partner, this is a part of our onboarding process. But if you are an existing partner and you have staff that needs to be trained, Dave does these trainings in a small group format um, every Tuesday and Thursday. There's a ton of resources, product documentation, partner tools, marketing collateral, price sheets, and everything on the eFolder partner portal. You, you just log in there, and uh, you see the URLs right there in front of you. You can do keyword searching in the Partner Center to find the resources Ted, you're looking for. Ted, you need Dave, to share your screen, because oh, they're still looking at okay. mine. Aha. Well, let me, um, let's do this. Sorry about that. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, okay. So anyway, um, here's what I was speaking to. But anyway, um, uh, additional training resources. Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, just a quick tip. Um, next month, um, so we do one partner chat a month, which is where we talk about business topics and one expert series where we talk about technical topics. And next month's technical topic is eFolder BDR for Shadow Protect Recovering to a produ recovering a production environment after a virtual failover. So Dave showed today, you know how you can either virtualize on site on the BDR appliance or how you can virtualize in the eFolder continuity cloud. But then the next question is, is okay now how do I roll back to a production environment, either to dissimilar hardware or restoring a location that's recovered power, whatever the case may be. And that's that's the topic that Dave will address in next month's webinar. So keep an eye out for that. And then just a uh, quick plug for a couple of our um, upgrade programs. Uh, let, me, let me speak to the one at the bottom first, the BDR Rescue Program. Um, this is a program, if you have any Zenith BDR appliances that are field deployed and you're not yet ready to do a forklift upgrade on those, you can use the eFolder BDR Rescue Program. So what it allows you to do is simply point a, a field deployed Zenith box to the eFolder cloud and actually protect that data in eFolder's cloud environment as you're getting ready to migrate away from a Zenith, um, Zenith deployment. And we have a special rate plan for that that's only 15 cents a gig. And we call that the BDR Rescue Program. We've had that out there for about two years. And again, it's ideal if you have any Zenith or Datto appliances out there that you're getting ready to migrate, but you just want to protect the data in the eFolder cloud. And then the program at the top is the BDR Upgrade Program. And this is a program that allows you to um, uh, decommission and trade in a competitive BDR appliance, either from Zenith or Datto or Axiant, and uh, in exchange, eFolder will give you a thousand dollar credit off the hardware for a new eFolder BDR appliance. Uh, you ship the you ship the decommissioned appliance in uh, free to us, free inbound shipping, and we responsibly recycle that appliance. But you get that thousand dollar credit in the minute you book um, that order with us. So two different programs to keep in mind. And now let's dive back into your questions here for a couple more minutes. Um, uh, let's see here. So David wants to know, um, kind of back to the continuity cloud question, what is the process to get a VM running in the eFolder continuity cloud? Is this something we can do entirely ourselves, or does it have to be requested and set up by eFolder? So um, once, once you have opened up a critical ticket with support, uh, and order the continuity cloud, and they provision you that node, um, which I believe our SLA is two hours if there's not like a regional national disaster like a Superstorm Sandy. Um, but typically, you'll get this, and then once you have access, um, you, you basically download the data and get it going. But you do need to contact support to get the node first, uh, and then after that, it's Basically, the steps that I showed you, you get the Shadow Protect data down to the box here, um, and then uh, start to virtualize it either with VirtualBox or do a bare metal recovery into the Hyper-V machine. Right, but you have, uh, I guess it's important to add that you, once we provision that resource, you have RDP access to the resource, and you really are in control of that whole computing space. Like you, yeah, it us. looks, 
it looks exactly like this. You get this access right here. Right, so, and kind of a related, um, a related question to that is Robert says, are there any configurations that I have to make to my firewall in order to use the virtual server from the eFolder continuity cloud? The firewall on which end, though? Is the firewall on this, this uh, end, the well, continuity cloud I mean, node? That, that wasn't clear from the question, but <laughs> it can so, I mean, I think he means so the fire. I, mean, I think he means can you, do, do, does, are there configuration steps that the partner needs to take to configure the, the firewall in the continuity cloud node? There are. Um, and our, our tech support would be more than happy to help walk you through. But in this documentation, there are a handful. This is what the web interface would look like. Uh, you can go in and assign the internal uh, you know, LAN, you know, the different NICs that you would have on your internal network on the BDR, um, and then your DHCP servers, your, you know, your, uh, your NAT port forwarding, whatever you needed to do to get those services opened and accessible to the cloud. There's a good bulk of them here. But um, our tech support will walk you through hand in hand. And uh, our tech support guys love it when they get critical tickets at 2 o'clock in the morning because they get a special rate for that. So if it's a true critical ticket, man, they'll, they'll, they'll get up and work all weekend with you because uh, they love it. So um, don't hesitate to, to reach out to them. And uh, we get really good rating and reviews on our tech support guys. And they'll walk you through hand in hand. And we've got guys on our tech support team that know this inside and out. So if that's a, an area where you might be a little bit lacking or the person that knows it isn't available, then our tech support guys would be happy to fill it. OK, great. Um, a couple questions around uh, just monitoring um, and the eFolder portal. Um, maybe you could just give a high-level overview of how that works, and then maybe give a plug for some of the trainings you do on that. Um, yeah, monitoring as far as. Um, well, there's, there's a little bit of monitoring in the eFolder web portal here, and, and, and may actually more than a little bit. So uh, some of you that are a partner here already know this portal very well. Some of you who are you know, prospects checking this out today, you'll be assigned uh, a user account and a password uh, to get into the web portal. Oh, wait, I do need to show my screen, don't I? Yeah, I just I, I made you. Yeah, I just made you presenter again. I, I did what you did. I was like, yeah, let me just show you what I'm doing here, guys. Um, so you'll get access to a web portal just like this. It's brandable, and also, by the way, the uh, the eFolder backup manager software is also white labeled, so you'll be able to brand that. It'll have your logo. I'll just open up the one that's on my machine here right now um, and drag it over, so you'll get. It'll have your name and your logo and everything. You'll work with our branding department to get that. This will have your logo, your color scheme. Um, but you know, here's here's the machine that uh, we were just uh, on, or actually, you know, looking at and downloading the data, or uploading it and downloading it to the cloud. There is monitoring from a backup standpoint in this. And what happens is, you can come in here and look at some dash panel reports uh, and look look at these reports every day. Red is bad, needs human attention. Yellow is minor, might need human attention. Blue has never had a backup, and green is, is warm and fuzzy. And you can see this is our training portal and our demo portal. So there's a lot of blue that's never backed up. But from that, on your partnership, there's partner notifications here that you can, be, that you can set up. And if you wanted to create a new notification, you can choose to send an email, open up a ConnectWise ticket, synchronize it with ConnectWise, choose uh, what kind of events you want. Most of the partners I know don't want OK events. They want warning and error events as well. Um, we do, again, have uh, integration set up. The auto task is still baking. Um, from what I've heard, it's ready to come out of the oven. There is partial integration with auto task now, but we'll have better and full integration soon. Uh, but we do have the, co the, the full ConnectWise PSA integration um, right now today. Uh, a, good, a good place for you to come uh, in the portal is the Partner Center. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the trainings in the Partner Center showing you different things. Uh, a, a more recent addition to the Partner Center is the Learning Center. And this actually, we should have had this on the resource slide. But these are all the training videos that we have out there to date uh, for new partners, uh, for learning the Backup Manager, the web portal, installing the Backup Manager. We also have the BDR Shadow Protect Cost Wizard and the Aperture uh, uh, BDR Cost Wizard as well. This helps you kind of project out and do proper bids. But all of these videos are on demand. You can watch them anytime. Your techs can come in and watch them. But also, the trainings that we're doing 
on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays are at noon Eastern. And uh, the first session is noon Eastern. The second session is at 2 p.m. Eastern. And it's just a live training with either myself or one of our uh, lead tech support guys that we've brought in to kind of help out as well. Uh, and it's a very small group. Uh, typically, the mics are closed until the end. And then we have like a 10-minute, 15-minute, uh, sometimes 15 minutes over the hour uh, Q&A session for those who want to hang out and just really dig in and get specialized attention on those. But this is another good resource. Um, partner program resources here, all your price sheets, calculators, everything, and then all of your documentation. So if you want to know step by step of some of the stuff that I was talking about today, there's your Shadow Protect How To Guide. If you want to uh, know about integration, integrating your ConnectWise with our portal, there's your ConnectWise PSA uh, integration documentation. So that, that was a lot on that question, but I'll throw it back over to you. Okay, well, and I think we're, we're just about out of time, so I want to thank everybody for making the time today, for joining us. Hopefully this was very educational for you, and Dave, excellent job. We covered a lot of territory today, and uh, thank you everybody for joining uh, today's eFolder Expert Series. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>